Right. So, so let's back up a minute. Yeah. So the Frick Fine Arts Building, you know yes. the deal with that? A little bit. Do you know the story I with remember it? that it was in, I know it's the Henry Clay Frick Fine Arts Building, but it was donated in his daughter's name. Correct? Well, she donated, she donated his, his, she donated his, name. his yes. name. Okay, word. Because I remember, like, that that whole building is just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And then it's so interesting that it's just, like, astronomically prettier in there than yeah. like, a lot of the other buildings it's, at Pitt, other than, like, the cathedral. Obviously. I spent a lot of time there in college, and there's, like, a deep wait when I go in there. Just, like, this is too fancy. No. I don't trust it. It feels like walking into, like, one of, like, the, like the Parthenon, because it has, like, that big garden in the middle. That's nice like all so, so we can, we can kind of use this as a gateway into bigger conversation here. <laughs> but there's, you know, this Perfect. is the, 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 um, the, the degrees of separation for Henry Clay Frick. Right. Story here. Um, Cathedral Learning sits on Frick. Property. Most of Pitt was a donation from the Frick family. Exactly. The grounds themselves. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the Fine Arts Building was Helen Clay Frick donating to the University of Pittsburgh. She had an agreement with them to build this Fine Arts Building in her father's name, and it would house their art museum, right. their local art museum. Well, that was what sixty. 65, something it's like that. Mid 60s, late 60s. Mid 60s. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. And there's a lot of background with this with Helen. And, and Helen definitely was her father's child. Mm -hmm. very, you know, very similar character. But Pitt didn't do exactly as she had hoped, as she had demanded. Oh. And so she took her ball and went home. So it comes down to that I believe that it was a case of she only wanted American yes. art from a certain period, mm -hmm. and they okay. had the unmitigated gall, <laughs> yeah. the unmitigated gall to not just go outside of those eras, right. but to have those darn European artists involved oh, too. Oh, God. Right? I, know. <laughs> I know. You want to talk bad taste. God forbid. Bad taste. You know. So bad. <laughs> right. So she said... Forget it. I'm yanking all of this. She actually thought about making them take the name off the building. Holy shit. And she then went and built her own art museum in Point Breeze. That's right. The frick. And it's Which all like that old American <laughs> art that's like... Mm -hmm. Exactly. It was funny. When I worked at the Warhol as a gallery attendant, it was almost like... It, everyone would talk about their time working at the Frick Museum as being very somber and boring. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny to watch it bleed over into, like, who she was well, as, like, well, a founder. But that, that's just yeah. it, you know. Yeah. Um, Helen Clay Frick's, you know, life goal mm -hmm. was to redeem her father's name. Yeah. <laughs> and, and have him be this great it's a big benefactor goal. and a hero. <laughs> Yeah. Um, she did some wonderful things with that. And the, the best being Frick Park. Yes. Yes. He would not have done that on his own. Right. That was totally her pushing him to do this. So it's a beautiful <laughs> yes. thing. But that leads us to the other side of this Frick Park story. It's uh, right up the hill from here. Yeah, the other Frick Park. The other Frick Park. You yeah. have a story with that? No, I mean, so, you know, essentially, for context, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but, like, up on 9th and 10th, there's a very small... I oh, remember yeah. I was looking at Google Maps for something one time. I was like, is that like the Point Breeze Frick Park like bleeding over? Is it that? Yeah, big? just like across the river in Britain. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I was like, is this way We have this extra piece work. It's like it crosses yeah. over the green, you know what I mean? Like, it's like Rankin Bridge, you know, yeah. forks its way up. They yeah. floated it over. Yeah, that'd be right. awesome. So my friends won't cross bridges to hang out late. Like, but, but the park will come to The park, 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 park service They like okay, one big okay. five that goes underneath the lawn. Yeah, so. So, you know, at the time when, um, you know, this is post-strike, mm -hmm. 1890s, um, you have Carnegie building the Homestead Carnegie Library, giving something to the community. Right. You know, we can go down that rabbit hole as far as you want. But, <laughs> oh, please don't you know, there, there was this challenge then for Frick to do something. Right. So he gave the town of Homestead a park. But really what he did was take a garbage dump mm. and put fill on top of it, call it a parking bay. Done. We're good. 
So Classic. there you go. Little Pittsburgh fashion. <laughs> it, 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 it is so frick. Yeah, it really is. It's so frick. It's just to the point. Let's get it done. Put my name on it. I'm out of here. Right. So I wonder if there was any, like, was that, like, part of the pressure for his daughter to kind of try and fix that name? I think part of it, I mean, part of it is, you know, Hal was certainly aware of how people thought about mm-hmm. her dad. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of her drive, I mean, in addition to trying to sort of burnish his reputation, is the fact that, like, you know, by, by all accounts, Frick had a very good relationship with his family. You know, and then, like, she loved her father mm-hmm. and saw him in a certain way, which was very different than how broader society saw him. And I think a lot of it, I mean, you could, I guess you could lump this under trying to burn his reputation, but I think a lot of it was her personally trying to square her experiences with her dad, with the way society viewed him. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, that's part of it, you know, and then it's also this... Um, cultural and societal push at that time to um, give back, fill in Sure. Oh, I mean, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, a yeah, number of reasons for doing this. Very few of them are altruistic. Right. It, it really is social status. Right. You know. Um, Preserving a name forever in right. a very specific and, community. And, you know, um, doing it because, well, you want to impress this person over here. Right. It's because, right. well, you know, the, the Rockefellers and Carnegie's of the world are doing this. Right. So to have that standing with them, you oh, must yeah, do it too. Yeah, it's very status based. Yeah, right. oh, I mean, yeah. if you want to play, so, you know, with the big boys. So, <laughs> so that's part of it. To, to have entree into that world, you have to do these things. Right. So there's that part of it. But then there's also... You know, very much she was the the apple of her father's eye. Okay, they were two peas in a pod. Um, I'm sure there's other fruit and vegetable right. you know, cliches. Now, why don't you just riff on but, that for like a few hours? But uh, <laughs> uh, but but for her, you know, it was it was the goal of really the rest of her life mm-hmm. to. Put him into that same conversation as Carnegie's and Rockefeller's, right. etc. Vanderbilt's. Yeah. Because during his lifetime, he could never quite get there. Yeah. So you know, there's many, many stories uh, of this competition between all these guys, and, and um, in my mind, it, it operates like this. You ever see the Bugs Bunny cartoon? where he's in the barber shop and it's the, the two hillbilly guys with the long beards and they come in and it's kind of the Hatfield and McCoy's thing and they're constantly cranking up the chair to see who's yeah. higher. That's what's going on at that point. Right. And, and, and so, you know, right, Carnegie builds a building, Frick has to build a building taller. Right. Carnegie builds, you know, a mansion in New York. For cast and having right. an even bigger one. And I feel like I remember there was even a point in time whenever there was that competition, even when it came to like skyscraper and like office real estate downtown, where there was like I forget who came first, but the uh, uh where the close by where the Clark building was mm-hmm. was originally like office buildings for mm-hmm. Carnegie and like his offices and then they had to combine um at one point because of some competition specifically with uh uh some other iron person, I want to say. But I remember that playing into the politics behind, later, the attempted assassination. Right. Well, so what happens right. there, it, it's so Carnegie Steel's office building is on, what were they on, 5th or Forbes? I think they're on the Forbes side. Yes. Um, <coughs> and it becomes eventually part of where Kaufman is. Right. Mm-hmm. Carnegie Steel's there. Frick owns the building, or the, the property right next to it. Okay. He, he owns the property where the Union Trust is because he built that. He right. owns the property where the, where the William Penn was. He, oh, shit. He, he moved the church to build all of that. Um, he <laughs> up, owns a property Excuse me? across the street from that. <laughs> right. you, you ever just it's just the church. power that they have. You yeah. can just move churches? Yeah, sure. Just pick <laughs> them up. St. Paul's <laughs> Cathedral was... was and we've all done it. <laughs> Who hasn't? Right. Really, who I'm going to say, right now, there's no one in my life I'd move a church for. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, well, there you wow. go. So, so, wow. 
<laughs> Brian, is there anybody in your life you'd move the church for? You. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Not like your wife? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I appreciate that. I, mean, he's, I think he's known you longer, but you know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> really, I just want someone to move the synagogue <laughs> for me. Could you please? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know. but no, so, so, so Frick owns his property. Right. And, well, he buys it specifically <laughs> for this reason. To build building to block the sunlight the sunlight yep. from mr carnegie right okay now it's coming together what do you mean by block the sunlight they were that petty. to prevent <laughs> to prevent the best angle okay of the sun so, so that's that's a like you don't get to see the sun not a like oh daddy's a vampire he doesn't want to see the sunlight. Right. <laughs> okay well, <laughs> so, so 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 that's that actually that's 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 interesting you ever, you ever see the abraham lincoln vampire killer um, oh my god! Now, could could they have done that with like freaking Carnegie? Yeah, that would be. Absolutely. The thing is, Ron, you'd be like Zombies. the only guy who got here. <laughs> I want to see. Awful. I want to see the 1890s strike horror drama using zombies against the capitalists. The classic. The classic steel capitalist. So stri- <laughs> the strikers are the zombies. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. 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 I think Grim. it could work. You'll have to well, no. Sure. It's a big no. Grim. Okay. Let me take that back. Let's so, talk so it back. So what are the Pinkertons then, Grim? <laughs> Wait. Repeat that. Who are the Pinkertons then? Oh or shit. Would they be the zombies. I make them the zombies. <gasps> make them the zombies. That's, that's a better plot. Better, uh, yeah. That. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that would work. That could work. <laughs> that, well, but it makes sense because then it makes you know like. Carnegie and Frick like the zombie bosses. Right. Right, the famous tr- horror trope, oh, zombie bosses. <laughs> the zombie, yeah. the zombie yeah. king. The zombie <laughs> kings of Pittsburgh. Right. I mean, I think this movie also actually does kind of exist. Move over One of the later Romero, Romero of the Living Dead movies is is basically this plot. Which one? I've only seen the first one. Is, is it? Not the one in the Monroeville Mall, is it? Is it? Yeah. What it's is like. It? like so that one's great. It's I like basically like these capitalists take over this building downtown. It's in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And like these zombie like there's like one zombie who like gains intelligence essentially. Right. Big Daddy, I believe his name Big is. Big Daddy. Sure. And he like like yeah, like I, I don't want to say anything. Like he clearly like I don't know, if we're doing like, you know, a, an edible reading thing, you know, he is the the uh the proletariat, you know. Commander who eventually makes an allies with the other, you know, the work working classes unite. You know what I mean in order to overthrow the uh, villainous capitalists. So yeah, check it out. Actually, it's better than you would think it is. Yeah, like super obscure filmmaker George Romero. Real quick plug. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, I think this movie is super obscure. You never heard of it, right? You're right. You're right. Damn it. You know, I thought we were having a little original thought there, but for a late we day, hey, for a late day, Romero, shows, it was pretty good. No one has original. It's thought. true. No it's true. But that's why they had to keep building libraries after each other to, you know, make up for their crimes. All right, so so should we? That's that's a good yeah. yeah. Oh, should we introduce ourselves? By the way, that would be important. We've had a lot of cold open. Con- that's, feelings, true. So. that's true. That's we true. We can take a moment to do that. Okay. We can start on this end. All right, sure. I look towards camera here. Uh, <laughs> my name is Ryan Henderson. Um, I work for Rivers of Steel, uh, and a very long and boring job title, but essentially in our museums and archives department uh, and our historic preservation department as well. Well, then I'm uh, Ron Baroff, and I'm also with Rivers of Steel. I've been around since the uh, dawn of time, mm. pretty much, <laughs> um, and uh, oversee the museum and archives and uh, sundry stuff. Really, what I am is the collector of shit. Mm, yeah. It's true. The sundry specialist. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the my name, trinkets man. <laughs> my name is John Engel. Um, I we're also working with Rivers of Steel, and I have two also ridiculously long job titles. Mostly, I'm the guy who catalogs around shit for him. That's right. So nice to do it. And I'm Anne. I am a tattoo artist here at KSD in the radio room. But uh, before I turned away from academia, I did get my bachelor's in industrial history, and I still like to read and learn about that kind of jazz, you know. And I, we did talk about how we met John. I met John doing mutual aid, so I still like to try and stay has involved. Anyone, has with... anyone ever met me, really? Truly? <laughs> <laughs> has anyone met anyone? Just enter my life. You were just one day there. I mean, I don't I, <laughs> Does anyone know anyone, really? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right, maybe yeah. Too, so, some maybe of I, us are maybe slightly more open books than others. 
Okay. That's true. Not yeah. all of us can be as mysterious and full of lore as John. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, this, I'm, I'm Wait, we missed someone. Doug! Doug is a mysterious voice. I'm the that. cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> but we appreciate you equally. <laughs> the director. I, w- I was going to say a, uh, a, a catcher or a, a catchy catchphrase. Mm. So, yeah. I'll just do that. Go for and it. And then you, you can all take it off. Okay. No, we can leave. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Oh, on God. Live from the radio room at KSD. Beautiful. Perfect. Really good, good read. So, <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a name eventually. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm taking your, your gas as the person who's meant to provoke conversation. No, you're fine. But, Please do. Uh, That's why you're here. We are a cooperative space, John, where everyone is equal. Thank you. <laughs> oh, really? Cool. Um, what I was going to ask is, you know, sort of regarding the, the conversation around Helen Claybrick. Mm-hmm. Her, la- her middle name isn't Clay, is it? Mm-hmm. Is, is yeah, it? It's Clay. Mm-hmm. They weren't all Clay Frick, right? No. No. Okay. No, it wasn't hyphenated or anything. Okay. Just family name, I feel like. So, I mean, it, regarding the conversation around Helen and sort of the, the attempts to preserve, um, preserve, enhance, propagandize her dad's legacy... Um, something that, that a conversation I had very briefly with our colleague, Dr. Kirsten Payne, mm-hmm. um, is sort of the way that, like, the daughters of these industrialists were kind of all tasked with that duty. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? I, I, to an extent, yeah. yeah. Um, is there any uh, other interesting sort of um, legacy-building campaigns, either from the family or a foundation or something like that, regarding, like, local... Zombie bosses. Um, it, it, as far as the Frick family goes, yeah. it, it is still, and Helen has, um, <coughs> Helen has been dead for, gosh, 30 plus years yeah. at this point. She's still the guiding hand. Yes. Yeah. For the for the surviving Frick family, and there are Frick family descendants still. Right. right. Any museum <laughs> or <laughs> historic sites or whatever <laughs> that they fund. Yeah. Their, one of their primary interests is still sure. to promote what is basically Helen's vision mm-hmm. of her death. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, in um, fairness to the Frick, yeah. the Frick Pittsburgh, not to be confused with the Frick New York, mm-hmm. um, they are doing something that they've never done in their history before, which is taking a good, strong look at this story that they're telling. Mm-hmm. And are they telling it um, as truthfully yeah. and as mm-hmm. broadly as possible? Um, and they've realized that no, because that that guiding hand of Helen, you know, that, that is reaching out of wherever she may be up, down, sideways, I don't know. Um, hey, about a, ha- a mile has, away. Has That's been great too heavy a hand and has caused their story to become now this is my choice of words not theirs um, archaic yeah in a lot of ways and, That's and fair. it's not addressing the needs wants and, and um, goals I guess of the 21st century mm-hmm it's still very much rooted in the old Pittsburgh. Right. Well, in the ways in which a modern historic site, as we would say, creates interpretation. You know, when you go inside of a museum, you know, what you're reading on the little placards, what the people say when they talk to you, mm-hmm. whatever, um, has changed. I mean, yeah. in, in a lot of different ways. I mean, right. quite frankly. I mean, a lot of other museums, for whatever reason, have undergone similar processes at different mm-hmm. points, you know. Um, and they are altering. I guess my point being that it's not, it's not merely just also getting away, let's say, from maybe Helen's vision, but, like, and a lot of other aspects, upgrading what they talk about. And, you know, they have hired a team of, you know, straight shooters and killers, such as Ron and I here, to mm-hmm. assist them with this process, um, you know, full disclosure. But... Um, it, you know, it, it is 
interesting to go with, to go with what you're saying. I mean, but that's not the only site. I mean, you know, West Overton, I yeah. believe, also received quite a bit of funding recently from the Frick family. And again, from what I've heard, talking to the people there, you know, they, they, there is also still a similar push, though, to, to have him presented in a certain way, shall we say. Right. Well, there, so have you been to West Overton? Uh, no, I was asleep. When we went there, <laughs> I decided that was a sleep-in day. Okay, there you go. I and, and I haven't been there in a long time. Yeah, but the you know West Overton for those and who don't know, it is another historic site. It's related to to Henry Clay Frick. It is his birthplace. Mm. Um, actually, it's the home of his grandfather Abraham Overholt of Old Overholt Distillery, which there's is still being made. I think mm -hmm. Jim Beam makes it now. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's still around. Wow. Um, but it, it really very much for years and years and years was the typical you know, historic birthplace of a great white person. Yeah. yeah. And how, you know, from these humble beginnings, which are far from humble, yeah. um, he was able to um, raise himself up and, and become the, you know, millionaire and success and, and world leader that he became. Um, but they're, they're taking a harder look at that too. Right. Because along with that really is this whole idea of, you know, Frick was not born into poverty. Right. By any means. Right. He was born into a fair amount of wealth mm -hmm. that bankrolled along with others including the Mellon family. Right. His great growth um, in the um, coal and coke fields mm -hmm. that leads him to his place with Carnegie and well, the rest of the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, that, I mean, he was the coke king. Now, he set out with his goal early on to become this millionaire by the time he was, what, 25 or something like that? Really, 20. Oh, I missed it. Yeah. I just whiffed it. <laughs> um, Maybe next time. Yeah. <laughs> next week, <laughs> we, we all did. We all well, did. Yeah. Um, but it, it, but he, and he does that, but that was always like this triumphant story. But now right. what they're doing is taking a better look mm -hmm. at this and realizing that, like most of these guys, you know, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. He's climbing upon the backs of others and repressing right. people in the, in the coal fields and in the coke fields and, mm -hmm. and creating this, this um, um, legacy that's really just an illusion. Right. Of the great American dream. Okay. So, you know, there is that too, but that's yeah. the Frick family kind of pushed on that for a long time because mm -hmm. that's the story they want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, you know, what I think is interesting, you, you talked about this a bit in regards to Helen, is just like how much of this is a narrative that exists for like the very sort of pragmatic purposes of like portraying Henry a certain way. And how much of this is a narrative that they genuinely believe? Because he was their dad, granddad. Oh, but he definitely believes it. Yeah. I mean, right. but that's also a function of, I think, certainly being part of the family helps yeah. a lot in that yeah, regard. Yeah. But I mean, also, you know, at a certain point in time, the, you know, she was alive. I mean, looking at these guys this way, by these guys, Frank, yeah. Carnegie, whatever, as these sort of, you know, great men who are giving back. I think was looked at a little more earnestly than maybe we would look at it today. And it's not to yeah. say that people even in that time did not see some of those this way. I mean, if you're talking yeah. about other institutions that exist to burner someone's rep you know, reputation, see above regarding everything with the name Carnegie in it. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, rather, I mean, he, you could certainly read and we could talk about too, you know, his explanation for why he does this. Yeah. But a lot of what he is doing is also, especially with him, very much because he specifically wants to be remembered in a very specific right. kind of way. Well, right, it, 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 it is creating your own legacy. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because he never had kids, right? Uh, he had a daughter. He had a daughter. Had a daughter. Well, why, why have I not heard of his daughter? Um, because well, they, you know, they kept her in the basement. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she had a hump. Okay. No, it's... <laughs> they, <laughs> no. He has a baby. He became a star of Disney film. <laughs> 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 I don't they do. I that. mean, again, they do. Like, I was talking to somebody who like has encountered, you know, the Kardecki family descendants. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. still. But like, um, I overrode you. But you were talking about. No, I mean, like, I, you know, it, it, in terms of how much they believe it. I mean, I think Kardecki certainly. He certainly. I mean, they all did. But I mean, he certainly believes he's society's great man yep. who has risen from 
Oh like, yeah, pure American dream style. He has risen from nothing right. to become in a explicitly social Darwinist way. Yeah, you know the apex oh, yeah. of society. Listen, no one believed his own bullshit more than him. No, yeah, I mean he's right. the. I you yeah. know, mm-hmm. I in some respects I'd even say you know Frick was probably a little more honest about kind right. of who he okay. was. The All right, so that was. begs a good question. Yeah. All right, and, and one that I, I know we have dis- we have discussed many times, mm-hmm. but who is it easier to respect? <laughs> Frick or <Kanye? laughs> Personally, um, neither. Opt out. <laughs> opt out. I will say I have the bias of like my first historical encounter with learning about Frick was the Johnstown flood because I grew up so the close classic. to Johnstown. Mm. And it was, they were, I remember going to tours through the Johnstown Flood Museum, and they were honest that it was negligence on the side of Mellon and Frick and anyone else who was bought into the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club right. that they just didn't care. You ever just do a country club so hard and so bad that you kill like a thousand It's people? true. It's true. And those were all people who were still working in steel mills, who were like largely hold less stake than I guess like Pittsburgh steel mills did mm-hmm. at the time because it was definitely smaller but uh I mean all they got in return was like what the incline and the development yeah. of Westmont mm-hmm. like that's it and like well a few thousand dead right but, um... <laughs> it's just very interesting I don't know like I I definitely and I feel like too like the ethos behind Andrew Carnegie's donations and his opening and like his thoughts like you were talking about as being like this great man to humanity is still kind of deeply in the ethos of a lot of like the things that he donated to and a lot of the things that are still in his name. I mean, you think about like, I'm not fantastic university, but like Carnegie Mellon is still a private university that is incredibly expensive and very exclusive and tends to sway towards people who come for money. Well, but and that so, wasn't like, the original intention. Right, exactly. Right. But it's still something that I feel like is, there's still like that classism deeply in the ethos of a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the question of who's meant to, whatever, everybody loves the libraries, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, the libraries, were libraries. Also, particularly at the time in which they were created, would never have been able to be used by the people. Right, exactly. He, like, Again, and also why are they created? They are created in part because his name gets to go on and they're very expensive, but they're also created because... We're educating the working class. It is. <laughs> this will... Not just even that, but if you too apply yourself, mm-hmm. you will, again, going back to his explicit belief in social Darwinism, <laughs> be able to raise through the ranks in the same way that I did and elevate yourself to a not only a higher class, but a higher state of being. Right. Like, there, there's a caveat to that, though, because it's not everybody. No, it's not everybody. <laughs> no, correct. Yes, I read one chapter of his autobiography where he talks right. about how being Scottish genetically set him up. To be. <laughs> oh my if, god! If, if you are of the proper character, yeah, yeah. because the 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 whole problem with this social Darwinism. Okay, well, there's a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. But, <laughs> but so so I I guess what what happens is you get. This whole notion, and you had mentioned it earlier, mm-hmm. um, that Carnegie like built these libraries to, and you didn't use these exact words, but it was sort of there, was that kind of um, you know wash himself of these sins. Right. No, um, he didn't do it out of guilt. Right. Which is which is the you know fallacy that's out there. Mm-hmm. You know that Homestead mm-hmm. gets built in eighteen ninety eight. Because his this great guilt he felt over the strike, right, yeah. and the and the battle. There's no great There's guilt. There's no guilt. There's no, no guilt. Um, it is purely based upon the fact that this is his um, function in life mm. as a man of means, as a man of superior genetic makeup. Yeah. Superior <laughs> right, superior intellect. Let's say yeah. that he was able to make himself into this, right. and, and so he's going to give something to these communities because if you leave it to the communities themselves, they're going to screw it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If yes. you leave it to the working class, they are going to drink and whore it all away. Mm-hmm. So, Classic. we must help those that cannot 
help themselves right. that are not born into such a station and such a genetic line that they are yeah. able to do this. Mm. So kind of going back to my question of looking at these two, which are the two main characters that come up time and time again here, maybe respect is the wrong word. Sure. Mm -hmm. But I actually find Frick more palatable than Carnegie. I can see that. Because yeah. For sure. Frick didn't give any fucks, yeah. okay? For lack of a better way of putting it. He was a bastard. He was fine with being a bastard. Yeah. He didn't put any pretense into it that he was trying to raise anybody's station. Mm -hmm. He wasn't trying to, um, you know, snow anybody in this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, he did what he did purely because he was a capitalist. And right. that's what capitalists do. Right. If somebody got hurt in the process, well, that is the price of business. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is Carnegie thought the same way, but his public face wouldn't allow yeah. that. Right. Classic Carnegie story uh, is Carnegie's support for the peace movement, um, which we, he was very well known for. Um, peace and what war? Uh, it starts really, you know... Spanish American War, but right. into World War One, he led a huge, huge movement mm -hmm. to stay out of the war. Sure, mm -hmm. and you like broadly in, in interwar periods too, like, yeah. just promote peace in general as well. Right. Right. But uh, where do you, where do you think, <laughs> where do you think the war material came from for the U.S. Army in that period? Every mill that he owned. I, I mean, which again, the reason I bring this up is that like. You can go back. I mean, whatever. They're in the archive. You can find them. I mean, there are political cartoons from this period, which you point this out. That yes. I mean, I forget. It's like one, it's one where he's like holding the dove and like, I don't know, is there like guns coming out of his jacket at the same time where he's like looking at the battleship or whatever? Like the idea of his sort of hypocrisy in this way, again, of his believing all the same things that Frick did, you know, making money, essentially being the main thing that he believed in, but also like... One thing to present himself as this, I don't know, kindly old grandfather, but or perhaps probably as he would see it, honestly, as the patriarch of, you know, yeah. sort of America to kind of an extent here. You right. know what I mean? Like, you know, I mean, it was, again, it's not like this was some even great secret in the period. It's, right. Right. So, so what, what happens in Homestead um, that changes the tide of the mill? That that takes the Homestead Works from being this smaller rail mill uh -huh. and allows it to grow to be the most dominant steel mill in the world for a period. Mm -hmm. Quite simply, it is a naval contract. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, to, to make armor plate, which becomes the Great White Fleet, which becomes mm -hmm. the symbol yeah. of mm -hmm. American, American power. imperialism. Just mm -hmm. the ground us, what year is this? So this is, well, 1886 okay. is when they get the contract, mm -hmm. and that starts the building of the Great White Fleet, which then leads into what happens in 1898 mm -hmm. with the Spanish-American War. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all grounded in that. Right. This guy who's talking about pacifism, yeah. who is writing about the ills of war, yeah. and that, you know, that this is essentially the greatest flaw of humans yeah is profiteering well <laughs> you, you know, know i it's perhaps unknowable but what strikes me about that is there's a deep grain of cynicism and at least in the way that you tell it of like this guy <laughs> well not not from you but from him yeah. of like of he i can imagine him going oh you, you know it's just it's an unfortunate part of human nature that we are doomed to war may as well make some money on it while we're doing it i don't like it but, you know, someone's going to do it. Well, do you think any of it had kind of like a, I mean, obviously like a nationalist edge to it specifically, like even though, mm -hmm. like, I'm going to want to advocate for peace publicly, like, I still want America to win, like any yeah. conflict it's in. Well, it, 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 it falls into the, the kind of um, domain of peace through strength. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so his rationale with that is if this is going to happen, 
yeah. if the U.S. Navy is going to expand it, they're going to yeah. start doing this, then they need the best materials right. in which to do it. We make the best materials. Right. Mm -hmm. And this should be used as a peacekeeping force. Right. Which folds so neatly into his, you know, social Darwinist eugenicist opinions of like, well, we are just we're white, we're better than them. And so therefore, you know, like they need us to be in charge. Right. Us That's being every other human being in the world. Right. Right. And it doesn't feel a whole lot different than like whenever now like the United States presents like, oh, we we're really against this conflict, but you know, we're still funding them with all of our weaponry, you know, Oops. and all of our <laughs> military technology that we left there in previous wars and that we're selling to them. Like, you know, it kind of feels similar to that still. I don't know. Well, it is part of the whole military no, industrial complex. complex. Yeah. <laughs> well, damn, I guess that is what it is. <laughs> Why did you become Southern for just that? Because yeah. I'm learning. What's I mean, the right, that's time? the learning voice. It's interesting. Yeah. You know, my, my, my honest opinion is, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, Carnegie didn't mind seeing whatever American power. But, right. like, at the same time, I, you know... I think his motivations are a lot crasser than even that. I literally, I mean, I genuinely think it's basically like there's a buck to be made. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, I mean, Carnegie, I don't know. This is oversimplifying maybe a bit. Like, you know, he has a lot of writing. If you want to get a viewpoint in the man's mind, the truth is that there actually is a lot out there from yeah. him himself that you can read. Right. But like, it, his allegiance more so than anything maybe even to, and again, I'm sure he has some amount of nationalist beliefs, but like is to the, I would argue, the concept of capitalism in general, which is that, you know, if you're if you're making money, that is a sign of your again yeah. your sort of moral superiority. Yeah. So he's not gonna you know he's not gonna turn down uh, a a opportunity to get some money yeah. to borrow his own coinage, the gospel of wealth. Yeah. Right. right. Another incidentally, uh, another great Carnegie story is you can have to remind me of the writer's name, but his sort of hero as far as his social Darwinist beliefs. Oh, Herbert Spencer, who yeah. visits, mm. who he, he has him here in the him. United States and has him visit. Edgar Thompson, which, huh. or and both Braddock and Edgar Thompson, I should say, I'm yeah. sort of expanding that into the town here, but Braddock yeah. and Edgar Thompson, which really is, in, in a lot of ways, Carnegie's baby, it's the only one that he really builds from the ground up, yeah. um, or at least in this region, but basically, he invites him here to Braddock and Edgar Thompson to show him the model society which he has built around the mill, and the guy shows up and is basically like, Looks like shit. Smells like shit. It's filthy. I hate it. This is terrible. Classic. Everybody hears a hog. You know, first time I've ever um, agreed with this dude. So, so to make it even better, so Carnegie has been reading Spencer. He loves Spencer. He ser he seeks him out. Yeah. Yeah. When he goes to England, he seeks him out. And he gets you know he meets him and, and, and Spencer's like this dude won't shut up. <laughs> okay. like this that. dude will not shut up. But whatever. Um. So he, he does, he invites him here. Spencer comes, and, and I, I believe it's the, you know, um, I forget the exact wording, but it's essentially, you know, a, a, a minute in Braddock is like lifetime in hell. hell. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right. All right, that's... <laughs> <laughs> there was also that one quote that was like, Pittsburgh is hell with the lid off. Right. That one's still famous. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And this is a, kind of a spin on that, though, you know, from a different angle. But, you know, so he does add a whole, like, this, this is hell. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you didn't create something beautiful here. You actually created, you know, th this this cesspool. Yeah. Okay, it, it's dirty. It's disgusting. People are living in poverty. You know, they they are being dehumanized. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. This isn't part of this wonderful machine right. that you're building. This is actually what's yeah. wrong. It's obvious. Being... He says all of that. Right. And then turns around and says, you know who I really like in your family? I like your brother, Tom, because he likes to drink. So then... <laughs> it does. <laughs> yes, so so does. he then yeah. starts palling with, with, yeah. with uh, Carnegie's brother. Yeah, right, which, load. Yeah. Yeah. Right, which is just another boom. All right. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I know the classic Carnegie story, though. I, you know, the whole social Darwinism thing, too, at the end of the day. I mean, it is funny that this guy, again, comes in and says that you did this wrong for, like, I guess what most of us today probably view as a sort of uh, villainous goal to begin with, which is sure. a social engineer, you know, a, a better class of people, again, moving these wretched Eastern European, you know, to, to be able to join polite society or whatever. Yeah. But, like, I, you know... I, 
it, it is funny though that again to kind of tie back is what we're talking about here i mean i think you could sort of characterize spencer's points as being that though carnegie again has the pretensions of doing this uh-huh. on, on sort of its own terms or whatever he still is letting his again capitalist mindset get in the way of any sort of actual social improvement he could hope to accomplish right, right. His, his his real answer at the end of the day for how you do this is to throw money at these institutions yeah which regardless you know really have no real effect on these people's lives and are really there is something that you said before right. because that is what if you're in the social class the kind of things you fund music halls you know um, museums, academia, ooh, academia. Again, the libraries today are something which is probably more accessible by the common man. But again, yeah. at that time, look at look at, look at the the amenities in the one in Braddock or the one that is in Homestead. When you're yeah. talking the pools, these different things. Yeah, you know, some of that is a in there because of the strong mind, strong body is sort of yeah. You know, very but like also mind. also be but like nobody has time to do this. If you're yeah. working twelve hours in the mill, you're not yeah. going to the pool. Right, and, and then. Let's get into one other piece of that is not everybody could even go in there. No! I mean, I'm not even talking. Let's, yeah. let's say that the workers did have time. Uh-huh. Are all the workers going to be allowed in? No. Nope. If you were black? No. Nope. Black, you're certainly not getting in. But yeah. it's like you also got to... If you could, if you went in through the, the basement. Yeah, the basement entrance. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you can only use certain facilities. Mm-hmm. So it, there was... You know, this notion of leveling the playing field, but that's all it is. Right. You know, well, it's, it's also at a time, too, when, like, you know, you got a place to see the content we're at American history. I mean, you know, the 1800s here, where, like, you know, the <laughs> real white people in this time are, at this point, you know, sort of the, what would be UK Anglo-Saxons. descendants today, yeah. Germans, right. you know what I mean? So, like, again, yeah. there is, you know, the bad sort of Southern Europeans and Eastern Europeans, you know. I, <laughs> that's in a lot of respect he's talking about whatever yeah. civilizing society that's yeah. who he means you know yeah, what I right. mean it's, it is this whole thing about like it's, it's not the great unwashed it's yeah. ancient yeah. racism <laughs> well the thing that, that you know I think you're kind of getting at Ryan but to make maybe a sharper point is like especially the universities these institutions kind of exist to train the next generation of his managers yes you know the people who are going to run his plans for yes. him mm-hmm. whether he's even conscious of that or admitting that or not well, that so was it's a nice idea fringe benefit, huh? Tech. Right. Yeah. No, yeah, no, I mean, exactly. I'm certainly Carnegie conscious tech. of it. Exactly. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah, that is exactly what Carnegie Tech, Carnegie tech is for. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, and, and, and so, you know, we spent a lot of time bashing him, but the genius of the guy is knowing when to invest right. yeah. and finding the best of the best to hire. Right. You know, and being a strategic businessman. Oh, he's a very up. good businessman. Yeah, exactly. It's just that being a very good businessman usually means you're evil. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's just, it strikes me that he's erecting sort of a giant pipeline of, like, you know, for generations of, like, you go here, you get pressed in through the library, you spend your life reading little books that I wrote, and then you go to the university, and then you get a job at my plant. And, you know, there, there's a ni- nice little progression that he has erected. Mm-hmm. Right. But we don't want the nice educated people to be... You know, working with the people who, you know, are actually getting paid like garbage to be there and stuff. Like, I feel like they all still just collect it in circles like that, you know. Right. I mean, so, you know, going back, Frick, Mm -hmm. you know, um, donating land to the city. Mm -hmm. Doing it because it's the social status thing to do. Mm -hmm. Right. In the end, though, there's a lot of positive that comes out of that. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know. It, it isn't necessarily their intention, but it is the collateral right. of it. Um, you know, so looking at Oakland, the development of Oakland, mm-hmm. and, and as a civic center, that's happening because you've got Carnegie pushing for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mary Shenley gives a property to the city because Carnegie is pushing Bigelow and pushing McGee, the McGee brothers mm-hmm. to acquire this land. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He makes this connection for Mary, with Mary Shenley yeah. that they end up getting it. So even though there's huge mountains of bullshit mm-hmm. <laughs> that, their, that their fortunes are, are, are built upon. Literal mountains of bullshit. Right. Right. In the you know, outcome of some of these things are wonderful amenities that that are left into the future Mm -hmm. 
Well, so it's, you know, for all of the, the, the evil, there's still this glimmer in there mm-hmm. that, that something good can come out of it. If I might make a critique of specifically the parks, I love the parks. Frick Park and Shenley Park are great. They're really only, or I've only ever experienced them in the context of the post-mill world, which is to say the ecological devastation wrought by the means by which these people made their money. So, like, yes, the park is good. I love the parks. But at the same time, they really have the value that they have to me currently because of the actions taken that indirectly led to their construction. You know what I mean? Which, you know, what can you do with that now? But that well, is again, they are nice libraries, John. They are very you know, nice but, libraries. You know, it, you know, but I mean, well, that's what all of it is. I mean, the truth is, yeah, like, you know. Uh, the institutions and the parks and the land and all that stuff is very nice. It's just that what you should remember anytime you go into one of these is how this money was made. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And speaking from experience, working for some of them, still not great. <laughs> <laughs> not wrong about that. Yeah. Like um, many other pit work study students, we had to <laughs> have our share there, but <laughs> yep. <laughs> Well then. Well, oh, this has been riveting. <laughs> <laughs> Did we come full circle enough? I feel we have. I feel we have. I think we're back to understanding. You know, we've we've hit on why they donated, where, you know, we got all the W's. <laughs> <laughs> we still have one. That, yeah. But well, who? Win. Who? So, we yeah, we hit who? There was a win. And there was a win. You yeah. asked yeah. about a year. So yeah. 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 <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you, for being here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anything else you want to hit? Uh, I'm good. Well, right then. Sir? What's our time check? 